things, but my my favorite phrase is, um, uh, you know, if, if 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 you know when you get in the smart, if you're in a, if you're in a room and you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room, right? So, I'm always been happy to be in the room with Lee because Lee, in his um, expertise, he's a sports psychologist. Uh, he's a he's a coach. He's a father. He's a mentor. And he's got like incredible experience to support to all of us. Um, and I met him like several years ago when we were speaking at a, um, uh, I think it was a UEFA conference in Geneva several years ago. And uh, I got introduced to him and we just hit it off. And I've just, I'm always picking his brain. I'm always, because again, he's the smartest guy in the room. So. With no further ado, uh, I will introduce to Lee Hancock. And Lee, take it away and uh, give us your presentation. By the, by the way, Tom, Hi. by the way, Tom, real quick, what time is it over there in Japan? It's two o'clock in the morning. So I'm just waking up just to be with Lee and you uh, from two o'clock until four o'clock in the morning. So it is warm. Yeah, that's it. Thanks for, thanks for jumping on. Always. That's great. Take it away, Lee. Um, thanks, Tom. Um, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I mean, thanks for having me. Um, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but um, thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I've known these guys for a long time, and I'm aware of their work and what they do, and I'm happy to come on here and excited, honestly. And um, Paul and I were just talking about when we first met, which is a great story. We've told it, we told it once before on a podcast, but uh, <clears throat> in case you didn't hear that podcast, which is probably highly likely, um, he and I were roommates as coaches and we were in McMinnville, Oregon. And we got there, I don't know, one or two o'clock, both knackered, you know what I mean? And we get to the dorm room and bunk beds, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm on the bottom bunk and he's up top and I said, man, I said, I opened the window. I said, I'm just going to take a little nap. He goes, he goes, me too. And so we took this nap. And like uh, the fact that we both remember this story is tremendous. He looks down. He looks down after he woke up, which could have been 10 minutes, could have been an hour. And, um, and he goes, uh, he goes, man, did you take a nap? I said, man, that was the best nap I've ever taken. He said, best nap ever. So now whenever I see Paul, the first discussion is, Best nap ever. So, <laughs> yeah, a good story for me anyway, because literally best nap ever. Well, it, it was the best nap ever because <laughs> you woke up, you're in a dorm room, right? And uh, the window's open and the sun's out and there's a light breeze and there's a tree right there kind of flowing by the, mm -hmm. the window. And you just, you wake up and you're just like, all right, that's perfect. Yeah, good, good stuff. So, <clears throat> I mean, look, guys, thanks for having me. I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen here. I'm going to talk a little bit about when, when Tom and Paul said, you know, you want to come chat? I said, sure. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And then I, I didn't remember that I have a book coming out and I probably should start pushing that. Um, Cause it's, I, I'm really proud of it and I'll talk a little bit about it and, and really get you to think about some things relative to the book and, and, um, uh, and the ideas in there. And so, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it and, and really get your feedback as well. Um, because again, this is my first kind of go at talking about it. Um, and just so you know as well, uh, I'm, I've always been super um, critical of my own work. And when I talk about my own work as opposed to other people's work and researchers and things like that, it's hard um, for me. And so this will be an interesting experience for me. Um, so anyway, and just as a reminder, as you come on, just mute um, until yeah. you have you know something to say and then happy to to unmute you and, and go through that whole thing. So you gave me the function to share, right? Yep. Cool. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop you guys up here. I have a second screen. Right here that I can see you guys. And I, yeah, if you, Paul and Tom, as I get yapping, just um, stop me. Um, and, and ask me a question. I'll try and grab the hands too from your, yep. if you raise your hand and everything like that. But um, yeah, so, I mean, this is, um, this is the cover 
Um, and, and this is the idea. And I'll, again, I'll talk more about it. But I want you to start to consider this and think about this. And, and really, my goal today is get you to think a little bit differently um, about um, talent. And then I'll go through one of the things that I talk about in the book, which I actually do and I will talk a little bit about tomorrow. I have the A senior course. I do all the sports psychology for the A licenses. I have the A senior tomorrow. And I'm going to talk about one of these concepts tomorrow, but differently because they're working with pro athletes and, and um, USL athletes and college athletes. So, so how do you define it? Why does it matter? And what can you do to make a difference? And so, um, I mean, look, if you are, I'm starting to tweet more. Um, again, I'm not great at it. You know, I'm always um, a huge admirer of people that are, have things that are awesome to say and funny to say, but I'm trying to put myself out there more and do that. Um, and you can follow me on there or you can hit me up on my website there and you can check me out. But yeah, I mean, these are the things that I, I do and have done for a long time. Um, I'm a professor at, in a state school in California, have been for a long time. Um, <clears throat> and I've coached, I have my licenses and I've coached high level athletes and, um, you know, and AYSO five-year-olds and, uh, and I've enjoyed the experience in both, quite honestly. Um, <clears throat> I'm a sports psychology coach. I've worked with different teams, pro teams. Um, I was at the Olympics in Rio and I was going to go to Tokyo, but decided not to. So I worked with them remotely um, and I've created different programs as well. Um, some things for MLS teams, some things for pro clubs, youth clubs, um, did stuff for the Galaxy, created the high school for them. And so yeah, just different experiences. And I've been able to collect these things. And quite honestly, they've made me a better person. I think a better teacher having learned what I did well and poorly. And I'm a dad, you know, which is probably my um, most challenging uh, talent endeavor. Um, and so <laughs> ha happy to talk about that as well. Uh, but I've been working in these environments for a long time. And I'm again, happy to share my experiences, both my failures and my successes as I kind of go through this stuff. So but what I want to do here first is I want to kind of open this up. Um, and again, as a reminder, as you guys come in, just mute yourselves until maybe you have something to say, and then I'm happy to, to turn it over to you. So here is the question that I started with. And you know, friends have asked me, well how, well, how long did it take you to write the book? And quite honestly, probably about seven years, because I was like, I don't really know what I want to say. And I knew I had this idea and I had this premise, and, and, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to kind of get out of it. Then I started thinking about my kids. I started thinking about my own experiences and then kids that I've coached, you know, both the ones that I've selected and not selected, having been in, again, um, high performance programs. Um, and I thought, well, what, what is talent and can you spot a talented kid? Okay. And I thought, well, that's a really interesting premise. And, and as I started to go down the kind of um, pipeline of what it means to be talented in gifted and talented programs in schools and then in, in programs, there's a cutoff line. So I started thinking about that too. And I'm like, okay, so here, here's my scenario. Okay. So I guess I would ask you guys, can you spot a talented kid? And what does that mean? I'll take anybody. Let's say in sports, what are your markers? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, Mick? Yeah. Um, well, I think at, at the youngest age, it's like the first thing that we we do is it's we see. So if you see uh, a player and in this level, it's, it's a soccer player. Yeah. Uh, if they've got skills and talents. So if they've got a natural movement of the body and, you know, possession of the ball, they're able to manipulate the ball. That's really kind of the first uh, I think that's the first sign of, of talent. Yeah. Um, do you want me to continue no. or just kind yeah, of, like... that's a, that's a good start, right? It's, okay. it's probably make it's a, it's a great response. It's probably one that I would say as well. You know what I mean? It's like, we look for these things. What can a kid do? What can she do? Well, what, what is she not great at? What does she have a natural inclination almost to kind of do and relative to, to others probably. Right. Yeah. Um, anybody else want to throw it out there? How they deal with setbacks. How they deal with setbacks, right? So, so then you watch a kid in his or her environment and then how they function in that and then they fail and it's like, what do they do from there? Awesome, right? So I started to think about this as well. And then I started to think about the classroom, okay? Which is this 
kind of this one here. Just uh, I love these two here because these are probably my twins, you know, beating the hell out of each other. Um, can't sit still, you know. Um, and as I started to think about this, I said, okay, finding the talented kid is interesting. It's like finding, let's say I lined up 10 kids, okay? And you've got the 10 kids lined up and, you, and they're, they're doing something in front of you. And you say, that kid has talent. You know, number one is easy. Agreed? You know, number one is easy. Number two is probably easy. Okay, what about three, four, and five? Are, 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 what about those kids? Okay. And then I started to think, well, ha, ha, what about six or seven? And then I started to think, well, what does it mean? What about the kids that aren't talented? What, what happens there? You know, because, because kids that are selected as talented, you know, again, as, as I select kids, you know, I think, okay, that kid's got talent and we have these markers and we all have to do this. We all do it. Okay. But then I started thinking too, from the, what happens when you're untalented? What happens to those kids? Or what happens when you're deemed as talented early but then maybe you're, you're, you're not the top of the heap that week. How do you deal with setbacks as somebody indicated? But then I started to think, well, what happens to those untalented? And how do we, how do we start thinking about those kids? And how do we think about talent? Because then I also said, and I'll ask this question as well. How many of you are parents? You know, it's a rhetorical question, but probably a lot of you, right? And what if I said to you and I lined up those 10 kids and I said, okay, numbers one through nine, those kids have talent. OK, but the 10th kid, your kid doesn't have talent. Now, how do you feel? You know, and I think your kid's not talented. And, and, and you probably start thinking, what? My kid's got talent. You know, he or she can be so talented and they've got. So and it becomes interesting if your kid is the deselected kid. OK, or in a sports program where they're the deselected kid or in the classroom. And that's what I really start to think about at 10 12, 16, why do we start thinking about this, you know, really when it's your kid, okay? Or when you're in charge of a program where it's the B team, okay? Or even the A team, but it's not, not the top 11, right? There's always a kid who's not talented somewhere along the line, you know? And so that's just kind of, it just got me thinking about talent. I love this picture here because this is Harry Kane early on, right? Just a tremendous picture, which I'm sure a lot of kids are familiar with. But then I started to look at kids who were deemed as untalented in education. And I thought, well, what does it matter? Well, if you're a parent, you know why it matters. You know, if you're a teacher in different classrooms or you're, you're, you're a club coach, you know why it matters. You know, and if I put, you know, your child and his or her name there, you would probably want them to go through door number one instead of door number two. And this is where I started to go down the road because as you start looking at some of the research out there, which a lot of you are probably familiar with if you read some of the pop culture books like Outliers, you know, and they talk about how kids that are deemed talented get the best coaches, get the best teachers, get more ice time as his story goes when you talk about the Canadian hockey players. And so they get all of these great things, okay? And then the unselected frequently get these types of things. And that's the road that I started to go down because it's like, is door number one really better? Or is it better to fail early on and have that grit and all of those things that folks like Angela Duckworth say is so important in, the, in, the, in success. Angela Duckworth had a great tweet yesterday that talked about it's not just grit, it's also about selection and opportunity. You know, And if you think about, as an example, the top 10% who are deemed talented, which I'll talk about that number in a few minutes. These kids get these things and all the self-fulfilling prophecy pieces that go with that. And if some of you are familiar with self-fulfilling prophecy, the idea is kids that get opportunities or are deemed as talented really then get more opportunities, get better feedback, get better ice time, get more uh, kind human interaction, meaning when a kid makes a mistake, the coach goes, fantastic. When the kid who's deemed untalented makes a mistake, they go, again, you know, and all of a sudden the self-fulfilling prophecy takes hold. You know, and Chris makes a, a great point to me in a direct message, but I'll share it with everybody else. Keep as many children playing and engaged for as long as possible in the best possible environment. It's true. 
right? And I'll talk about the environment and how critical that is. But that's not always the way it is when, as an example, your kid gets told no in the classroom. And they go to, as an example, a, a lesser environment, you know? And as I was saying to Tom before we got on here, it's not to say that this place can't be good, door number two, okay? But these kids are frequently, if you know education, if you know sport, you might get a good coach. You might have high expectations. You might get good field time, okay? But you don't always get that. And so it's up to a caring, educationally armed advocate adult, coach, teacher, parent, to then maybe help and help them with their talent. Here, I would say, it's also not always great. What if you're deemed talented at a young age because you're bigger, faster, stronger? You know, is that the best way to go? And these are all just kind of questions that I pose in the book. And, I, and I'm not going to give you the answer to these things. And I'm not going to say one's better than the other. But I do want you to think about them, right? Which is how I start the book. Because lots of people have been told they weren't talented. And it might have been the best thing that ever happened to them. You know? And my contention is you could probably drop 10% of the people off in the world that get told no and they're gonna battle their way up, okay? But there's a great chunk of us, you know, that are told they're not good enough, Maya Angelou at a young age, uh, and have, uh, have a person that says, yes, you are. Thomas Edison, great story about him as well. Turner is a good one just in terms of what he's going through. And whether, they ha whether I know their background or not isn't my point here. There are lots of people that are told they're untalented which may or may not be the best thing for them. And what does that look like? Great story about Jimmy Conrad, a good friend of mine that talks about this and has talked about it in a lot of different places, but he wasn't good enough as a kid. I can also tell you that my experiences, this is my glamour shot, uh, that my experiences as a kid were very much the same. I was in the principal's office probably more than I was in the classroom. I couldn't sit still. I was definitely told I wasn't going to amount to very much and, you know, I had a couple of people in my life that said, listen, you got to get your act together and you're really smart and this is how you can do things. And I was like, really? And sometimes it takes those people to engage with very specific things in the environment that they put you around to go and do this. Okay. Tom tells a great story in my book because he was kind enough to write the foreword. There's a really, um, there's a really famous guy in this picture right here. Uh, and the other one is Zinedine Zidane. Okay. Uh, and Tom tells a great story about, you know, his upbringing, and he had somebody that believed in him, you know. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to throw these things out there, because that really was the idea behind my book. You know, and I thought, man, I just want to write about this stuff. And I want to put a whole bunch of ideas together. Um, and start talking about these things, because we, we all know that it's a journey, you know, that talent is a journey. And what that looks like and how we create that environment is so important for kids. And again, I've shared my, my little bit of my story here and I talk about it a little bit in the book, but I also think about my kids. You know, I'll share a story about one of my sons, one of my twins uh, at the end here. But, you know, they're, you know they, they're both, you know, talented and not talented in different things in their lives. And part of what my wife's and my, our challenge is, is how can we create this environment for them? And so as I started to think about what this environment was, I borrowed a little bit from sports psychology in terms of this idea of the zone. You know, when you're in the zone, you know, the idea is like, I'm just, I'm, if everything's flowing, everything's going in the right direction. It doesn't mean that things don't suck, okay? Sometimes things suck, okay? But if you have that right environment, if you have an understanding with the talented and untalented, um, then you have a real kind of impetus and idea to go forward. So that was really the idea in the book. And one of the, I, I traveled to a lot of places around the world and talked to friends in different places and visited academies and schools. And one of the places I went to was um, Salzburg. And my friend, Jesse Marsh, who is now out of work, um, but at the time was at Salzburg. And I went over there, I took my son over there to do some, to do some stuff at a couple of places. And, you know, Jesse was, uh, you know, drove us around and took us through the academy and it's amazing setup in Salzburg that housed the hockey team, the youth hockey team and the soccer teams. Um, and they've got an education system. 
they got these fields. It's tremendous. I mean, you can imagine Red Bull is actually housed in Salzburg. So you can imagine how they'd want their hometown um, place to look like. Um, Joan, hold on to that question and I'll hit that in about two minutes because it's a good question. Um, so Jesse walked us around and he was talking about how he, um, he, he was interviewing somebody for a job. And we were, he was talking about, and he was walking over and he would see this kid and they have pictures of all the pros and kids that have made it through the academy, you know, all throughout their, all throughout their, the inside of uh, the, the Red Bull Salzburg building. And he was talking to this guy about, um, about, oh, this kid's going to be the next. And he named the Salzburg player and he would go around and he'd see this other kid. This kid's going to be the next so-and-so player. And he did that with three or four guys. And he said, the guy said to him, he goes, well, he goes, he goes, how do you know? He goes, how do you know that? He goes, not every kid can be that guy. He goes, he goes, yeah, but how do you not know? You know, he goes, how do you not know? He goes, treat them as if you can, um, not as if they can't, you know? And he goes, we don't know which ones are going to make it. And so the idea is, can you create a great environment for every single one of these players who literally could be the next so-and-so, right? So it was those kinds of things that got me to think about, you know, different ways to create this environment, these zones, and having an open mind about what talent is, which I'm happy to talk about in a second. So the, the, the question to me was, um, talented players can develop on that area easily, but what about talent under pressure? So for me, pressure is an interesting thing. And I, I, it's funny you're actually asking that because it's, it's one of my topics tomorrow in the, in the discussion with the, the A senior guys. Pressure, um, pressure is what it is, you know? And it is always going to be involved in sports and education. One of the things that I talk about in my, in my book, and I talk about just when I talk to coaches is, it's about how we help the kid see his or her pressure, you know, and, and how we help them understand pressure. Because some kids innately, it's true, innate ability, I'm not gonna shy away from innate ability, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Some kids have an innate ability to look at pressure and just kind of manage it. Okay, that's their personality type. But it's also in, as an example, how we talk about success and failure, which I'll talk about towards the end of the discussion today, and how we help them frame it, right? It's like, look, you know, there's a, I don't know what that movie is, where the dad is, I think it's like a World War II or like a Holocaust camp where the, the tank goes through the middle of the city and the dad is creating this environment where, you know, it's like a game for this kid. I'm struggling to name the movie. Somebody is probably going to do it better than me, but it's like, it's all in how we help them look at pressure and manage pressure, because I don't disagree, Joan. Pressure is a, is a, is a really kind of a great, uh, like a talent, you know, um, talent uh, kind of marker, you know, when a kid can do it in a game. But as a 10, 12, 16, 17, 18 year old, it's how they learn to deal with failure and how they move through these experiences that give them an ability to manage pressure over time, you know? Um, so yeah, yes, life is beautiful. Is that you too, Joan? Same person? A plus, right? Yeah, great movie, right? Um, yeah, so let me let me just stop now and let me just kind of see if anybody wants to ask me any questions. And I'm gonna talk a little bit at kind of how I went through the book, talk about defining talent differently and um kind of looking at that just a little bit differently. So, but what I wanted to do is just kind of stop now because I've been talking the whole time. I don't want to do that. Any questions for me, you know, as I kind of laid out kind of the foundations of the book, and then I'll kind of talk to you kind of where I went in a second. Paul, Tom? Yeah, I, I'd say, I mean, super interesting. I, I like, um, you know, the, the idea of, you know, seeing the, the potential in every child and, and believing that the child can do it. I think that's, that resonates, right? That, that you're, you're, you're positively seeing potential. And I think it's, it's tragic. It's tragic when, when child developers uh, don't, don't have that mindset, right? Um, that's the first thing. That's the first kind of comment I have mm -hmm. because developing you know, is, is about ignition, right? And I think you have stuff like that in your book. It's about yeah. sparking that. What got me 
uh, the question I had in here, I just wrote some notes about it is, you know, the, you know, the, the door one and the door two is yeah. the potential if, you know, they're thrown into door two and then they have, you know, possibly good coaching, possibly not good coaching, possibly good methodology, all those potential talents or yeah. children who can develop their talents to whatever level they are, they may not get the same things. That's really concerning. Yeah. 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 And, and as I, as I continue to lay this out and again, I'm just kind of walking through the background of the book right now and I'll, I'll walk through it a little bit more and then I'll give an example of that as well. Because for me, it's like door number, I was actually going to call it door number one or door number two, you know what I mean? And my editor who, by the way, editors are awesome. If you can ever get one, I highly recommend them because I describe them as like a makeup artist. Like, you know, you know, me without makeup is, is bad. I'm fully made up today. I know that's not good for everybody, but um, but like, it's a big deal because like, uh, like the idea of door number two isn't awful. It's not, you know, being, being told you suck for lack of better terminology. And I don't, I'm not advocating this by the way, but if a kid has to deal with that phrase from, from, it's not, it's not lovely, but you know, a kid gets in the car and he or she's in tears like that. There, the amount of times that's happened in my house with grades or sport beyond, I can't even count, but, but they also have a dad who understands the psychology of failure, okay, and, and how to move through that, okay? Door number one, early success isn't always good. You know, one of the books that I read and I cite a little bit is Michael Calvin's No Hunger in Paradise, which you can get your hands on that book. It's about the academies in, in England. It's like, it's not always the best thing to be deemed talented early on because then what happens? You know, if you have a different perception of success and you feel like you've made it, you know, at 12, 13, 14 years old, man, you've you've peaked in high school. You're the coolest kid in high school. And then what, you know? Um, and so, you know, it's like, I don't know which one's better, but I do want, I always wanted to just talk about it, you know? Um, let's see. What's the question there? Uh, have them buy my book is really the answer here about how you can educate parents about talent. I mean, that's an easy answer. Um, I mean, apart from that, for me, it's about engaging parents, you know, and, and I just love what Paul and Tom do. Um, but it's about engaging parents and talking to them about the process of talent, you know, and, I, and I'll throw that out there here. And you saw it at the, one of my slides there a second ago is <clears throat> it is such a journey. You know, it is such a journey and such a process and, and providing parents an understanding of that piece right there that your, your son made the B team. Okay. That's not the worst thing in the world. He didn't make the travel roster. She didn't make the travel roster. I understand, you know, of course, then parents are going to lose their mind, but it's also about how do we make the most of failure, which I, again, I'll talk about here in a second. That's one of the things that I wanted to share today. So for me, it's about engaging parents and, and understanding their feeling about failure, you know, and, and feeling about, um, being deemed talented or untalented because when your son or daughter doesn't make it, it's a bummer. I, I mean, I mean, my sons haven't made rosters before. When you played a high level, that's the way it goes. You know what I mean? And you know, that, that can be so good. Um, but it, it is about engaging them and then educating them on a couple of concepts, which one is I'll talk about today for sure. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about Dr. Dweck's research today, just a little bit of it. Um, because I don't, I don't disagree with you. My, my thing, Chris, is everyone deserves an educationally armed advocate, you know, a parent that understands information, a coach that understands information and that has an understanding that that kid can absolutely improve, you know, to what level, who knows, but I know that ceilings are non-existent. And one of the topics that I talk about in my book, which I'll go back to my thing here real quick is, I'll, uh, I, have, I don't have it up yet, but one of the things I talk about is smashing ceilings um, and this idea of, um, of, sorry, I want to get you guys up here. I, I lost you guys. Hold on. Hold on a second. I got to go and do this. Zoom. I'm going to be in front of people live one day and I'm going to probably try and reach out to you guys like this and squeeze you over to the side because that's what I'm getting good at. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. There you go. There you go. Sorry. Um, yeah. So the the idea was, you know, ceilings don't aren't um, are, are are not fixed. You know, in terms of development, you know, ceilings are fixed on our homes. You know, but in terms of like education, it's glass ceilings. And I talk about glass ceilings and how that movement first started in, in with with women in the sixties and seventies. It was an act of Congress that 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 laid that pretty open. And I talk about it with kids and how to work through that. So. Let me, again, kind of move through this a little bit and, and kind of I'll open it back up to you again here in a few minutes. So um, I started with the definition of talent. And this is why it took me so long to kind of write the book because I was like, what? what am I trying to say? But I wanted to look back on talent and, and where the word came from and what it was. So, you know, Talent Code, tremendous book. You know, really, I think probably one that is um, catapulted, you know, the, the, the idea of talent in terms of us as educators and what Daniel Coyle talks about, um, you know, about that it's, it's innate, but it, it can grow. Okay. Then I found kind of some great research back in the day that talks about more like a will or an inclination, um, you know, but it's really about you, not relative to others. And again, this is how the word was used. And of course, a lot of us might be familiar with a um, biblical story of talent, which was about money, okay? And, and, and certain weights that were allocated to certain metals, which I, I just think is amazing because as you start thinking about talents and the weight that we give certain talents at certain age groups, it's a little bit like that. You know, it's like, well, that kid is big, fast, and strong. Yeah, but he or she's not going to be that way forever. You know, and so how, why do we weight the things we do? And that's talent identification, which is a little different what I'm talking about, but it's part of it, right? And then I found this, which was the, the kind of the first look at <clears throat> talent. And it's this idea of what a kid bears or carries with them or brings forward. And I just found that to be so powerful because as I start to think about my kids and I watch them fail, it hurts sometimes, you know, when you watch them do stuff or you watch a team do stuff and you, yeah, you're competitive and, and you think about it, but it's like, how do they feel in this process? You know, and that's kind of what I started from. It's like, wow, that I'm really intrigued by then how a kid feels in this process, you know, because that's a lot for any child to bear, both the kid who's been selected early in his or her talent and the role that pressure would play, as Joan indicated, which I talk about in the book as well. Um, and the kids that are labeled, you know, untalented early on, which I'll talk about that in a second as well. So this is what I wanted to put in the book, but my editors took it out because I couldn't get Eminem's permission probably. But as I started to think about talent and how that talent kind of, a kid gets told no and how he or she moves through that you know, and how they think about that. Like in the beginning, they were just playing and then the mood all changed, right? And then the fact that they can't get by with the regular or easy classes have taken some liberty with Eminem's lyrics, okay? And I just start to think how powerful this is in a kid and how he or she wants to be that, be better. And you can see it in some kids. And again, I contend that some of those kids might be fine. You know, they might be fine as they move through that, that, that desire to be, to be great, you know, um, but some kids may not have any idea, you know, and I, and I, I was talking to, to Paul early on as well. I used to do work in inner city schools and, you know, some of those kids get opportunities and some don't, you know, and, and, and the, the kids that don't in a lot of those areas go home to a, a set of parents that may not be educated. I may not know the best way to help them move through failure or manage pressure or deal with those types of things. It doesn't make the burning inside of them less in the kid. And so again, I started thinking about that from a kid perspective, you know? And then in my book, I moved through this idea of a popular talent development model. This is a guy called Gagne. Now, I don't spend too much time on this today, and I'll spend a little bit more in the book because the book is education and sport, okay? And I wanted to talk just a little bit about it today because of the number and this middle area. And 
again, this is in the book, but if you Googled Gagne's model of talent development, you can pull this up as well if you want to look at it longer. But again, I was fixating on this because I was like, well, why did 10% only get to be talented? Why? But I know that's the cutoff line for gifted and talented programs in schools. You know, I know it's a much lesser percentage as an example in high level MLS academies. Okay. But why? What, what about the other kids? And can you cast a wider net in school districts as Paul and, Tom, Paul and Tom have done to find those kids, you know? And, and so why is it the top 10%? What about kid 11? My kid's number 11. Is he or she not talented? And if they don't have somebody that's pushing for them or helping them understand what it means to fail and, and learn an opportunity from the failure, then it becomes that because the environment is so key, is so key. And so what does that environment look like? And that's really where I kind of took, take the book, you know, is this idea of the environment is so critical. And this is the, 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 the thing that I've screamed to myself over the years is you have no idea which kid is going to be a talented adult. Zero. There is zero evidence. There is no correlation um, or sorry, there's no causation. There might be some correlations here and there, but you don't know. And this is what I struggled with. It's like, what am I trying to say? How can I help? How can I think about this? How can I, how can I talk about how critical the environment is for the talented and the untalented, right? And I'll, and I'll talk about what that means in a second. But, but that's the thing. That's where I started to go. It's like, we don't know which kids are going to move along this yellow brick road, you know, to the Emerald City. But of course, as it, if I, as a parent, know this information, I can help my son or daughter be number 11, okay? I can help my son or daughter move through this. If I'm a coach and I have a B team, I can help that kid get to the A team. If I'm that A team kid, I can help him get to the first team. It's such a process because there's always something more with talent, always. You're, you're, the, you're the most talented academy kid? Yeah, welcome to the first team, son, okay? Sit down and do more. Oh, you're a starter in the first team? Go be an all-star. You're an all-star? Go make, go make the national team. You're the national Like, there's always something more. But it's like, if we have an understanding of what this environment looks like, we can help kids, you know? Because again, you don't know, you know? And believe me, I've been in the position of selecting kids. I have not played kids in a game before, you know? And, and I have selected kids or missed a kid. And those are the ones I think about. And I'm like, man, I, I totally screwed that up. You know, I'm not sitting here saying I can select kids and I know how to do that, but I am saying I know how to create an environment that gives every kid an opportunity. Um, I talk about this idea that development is nonlinear, and I believe that a thousand percent. And again, I know I wrote some notes to myself down here. I know innate ability exists. I'm not, I'm not ridiculous. I understand that. Okay. I know cutoff lines exist. I am not stupid. I understand that. Okay. But again, those cutoffs and, and, and things are interesting. Um, because we don't know. And then I'll pause right here for a second. I'll throw it out to you guys. Because it's really not just the definition. It's the labels. And then the subsequent approach that, that people take as a result of the label. Right? Because I know, I know if my kid is deemed as talented, which he has been, you know, in the classroom or in sport, or my kid has been deemed untalented, which he has in academics or sport, right? Then it's like the label that gets put on you and the expectations are different. They just are. Uh, and that's not always a good thing, you know, to be again, talented. So for me, it's like, think about these questions. And that's really the premise of the book. And I wanted to write something that, that caused people to, to think, again, I'm in high level sport. You know, I've, I've been in, I've been in, uh, in world championships with, with teams. Okay. I've also been involved with under five AYSO kids, you know? And so I've seen both sides, you know, I've seen the highs and lows of both sides. And my thing is I just want people to think about it, you know, and I wanted to provide then ways to create these great environments, education, sport, music, really it's all about these environments that you create. Um, to help kids get an opportunity. So Lee, question for you. Yeah. Um, it kind of goes back to like Carol Dweck and that the, the growth mindset. Yeah. Is the use of language. I mean, is 
is the biggest problem is that we label kids either talented or untalented. Well, isn't, it, isn't it just kind of like, you know, if you're looking back at like a really nice definition of talent, right? Yeah. And you, that one about innate ability, that, that yeah. is really, that makes sense to me, right? A, yeah. a certain talent is something almost that it was uncoached, uncoachable. It just happens and they're naturally gifted for it. So that's that. But then we get caught into, you know, you know, you're talented or not talented rather than the, all the Dweck stuff, right? Which is. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about Carol's stuff in a second um, because I'm, I'm pretty familiar with it, given that I, I did a lot of work with her stuff before it was her stuff um, early on in my graduate stuff. Um, but the idea in terms of language, language is critical. And the idea of talent being not fixed is key, right? And that, look, just because, let's just say my kid is selected at 11 years old and he's smashing it, you know, he is talented at the moment, okay? But what does that mean? You know what I mean? What, how do we look at that and how do we continue to, to help him improve as a talented individual? And as an example, your discussion about language is, is important because it's like, yeah, you're, you're talented now. You're doing some things that are making you stand out now, right? Which was mixed point earlier. It's like somebody does something that makes him stand out. Yeah, now, right? But how does that translate to a 15-year-old, to an 18-year-old, to a 22-year-old? And so, yeah, language and how that talent, again, for me, it's not about the word. It's about the label and how you approach that with the kid and his or her approach to improving and getting better and all these types of things, you know, both the kid who's like, I'm terrible, I'm garbage. And how do you help him or her deal with that? Um, to the kid who's been fantastic, you know, and that, that's one small part of talent, you know, but yeah, language is, is huge, huge. So like, if you're like igniting and, I, and I'm trying to look at this from the point of view of like developers, right? Cause yeah. pretty much everybody on here is a, is a coach. Yeah. Right. Of kids. Right. Of yeah. some sort. And and this this idea that, you know, whether you're a grassroots coach and you're coaching four and five and six and seven year olds for the first time. Right. And igniting them. Yeah. Igniting them with. Oh, that's fantastic. And you, you're doing so good on all yeah. that good stuff. And then getting into the to these ages that that inspire that player to young player to love it and keep going and then then really kind of reaching into the parents as well because, yeah because you know I mean I love that concept I mean I've I've started to not use that word talent a whole mm -hmm. bunch or try not to use it as much as I did in the past yeah. know, especially with youth players yeah you know because talent for me ultimately the greatest talent of all is hard work yeah. right and that hard work is that kind of that growth mindset and working. And so yeah. talent is really, can you individually, sorry, I'm just kind of going off on my own right now. Yeah, no, it's good. But, you know, it's, it's you individually, yeah. you know, taking your current status or your current place and, and driving it forward and you're developing your talents. So it's yeah. not like you're talent or untalented or untalented, but you're, you have a method of developing your talents. Yeah. The next yeah. Level. Well, and I'm not sure yes. exactly what that meant, but that I wanted to share that. Yeah. And I, you know, that's why I actually chose growth mindset to talk about today, which is, so I basically I'm going to talk about my first chapter. Okay. Which I just think sets the, sets the tone. But as you start thinking about that four and five-year-old, you know, and I can, I'll give you, and I'm, I'll, I'll give it in my, um, in my present, or in, in when I talk about growth mindset, but you know, the idea is when they understand, when, when they look at failure, it's, what do they do with that? You know, at four years old, at 10 years old, at 15 years old, and quite honestly, the environment makes a massive difference. Kids are innately born with how they perceive success, which I'll talk about here, but it's also what you do with it. And, and that was the idea behind these, you know, behind these um, talent zones and these things, because it's like, these are all things that I do with pro athletes, with child athletes, help educate coaches. And my thing too, and this is how I feel, which is why I love the coach education stuff that I get to do both here with US soccer, with, with anybody, is the art uh, of the science is key. You know, you guys are the sports psychs. 
you are the one that can make these 10 things pop, you know, because it's your understanding of the kids in front of you. Yeah, I understand this stuff research wise, but I'm probably nowhere near as good as you as an example with six year olds on the field. Although I'm pretty good because I did that when I was a kid and I totally loved it. Although if you put me in front of kids now, I probably do terribly. That was one of my most enjoyable experiences is those are those six year olds. Um, because I was like, man, I'm really terrible at this and I had to get better at it. Um, so, but it's like, I, here's the stuff and the, and the ideas in the book, but you know, your kids way better than I ever will. You know, your classroom, you know, your sons or daughters, how you apply this stuff is really important as they look at talent as a journey, not a destination, you know? So, yeah. So let me just talk a little bit about one of the things I talk about in the book, just to kind of introduce you to it. And it's, it's something a lot of us are fairly familiar with but you may not be familiar with the underpinnings of the theory, okay? So really for me, failure is super important, okay? I, again, I talk a lot in this discussion about parents uh, or, or about my experience as a parent because I you don't mind sharing about my kids. I'm not comfortable sharing about everybody else's kids, I guess. Um, so it's like this notion of failure um, has to be embraced. Okay, it has to be looked at as an opportunity, not as a catastrophe, you know, and again, I, I can recall times with my kids where, you know, and, and my players as well as I've coached, you know, where they're, they go and they make excuses, you know, or they go, well, it wasn't, that wasn't me, or, or they just start complaining and going crazy, which I'll talk about that profile in a second. But if you're not willing to embrace it, then it's really not going to have the effect that it can in terms of the focus on talent and the journey that talent is. I use this quote in my book um, and it's a great commencement speech. From time to time in the years to come, I hope you be treated unfairly so that you'll come to know the value of justice. I hope that you will suffer betrayal because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. Sorry to say, but I hope you'll be lonely from time to time so that you don't take friends for granted. And obviously you can read the rest on your own. And so I use this to get me into this idea of growth mindset, okay? Because it's like, of course, I don't wish this on people and he's not wishing this on you. But as you start thinking about this, and I've, I've said this to my sons, you know, I, you know, we they live in a nice place and, and to, have, to have failures and to have, you know, things that come up as obstacles is just so fantastic. And I've had this conversation with my sons about, you know, when they've been upset about something and I said, son, I said, I feel for you. I'm upset. I said, but, but if I could change any of this for you, I would never, you know, and we talk about the value of those things and they're in tears. And I, I tell them like, how much I love you and, and kind of, um, but of course it's, it's like, these are all good, good things to think about. Uh, Joe says another great book for this topic is talent code. Yes. Tremendous. Um, I cite talent code. I cite, um, I cite Daniel Coyle. In fact, I interacted just slightly with, with Daniel Coyle when I, I interacted with him. I got contacted with him. I used some of his stuff in the culture code. And I talked to him about, because one team that I worked with won a world championship. And I hit him up and I said, we use your stuff. And he was like, fantastic. You know, so this guy's stuff is amazing. So I, I, can't, I can't talk about talent code or culture code enough. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so, so let me just talk a little bit about growth mindset, but what, I want you to take something away from here. Growth mindset isn't too uh, unfamiliar with a lot of you, I'm sure, okay? Huge topic in education. Carol Dweck's a massive person in here. Her book, Mindset, talks about it. Growth mindset, failure is an opportunity to grow. Um, fixed mindset is blame that on other people. I wasn't born with this skill. I'm not willing to change. I'm not able to change, okay? Two different mindsets. You can be... Um, you can have both, obviously it's domain specific. Um, but what's amazing about Carol Dweck's stuff is that she was involved in some early research at the university of Illinois with a guy named Nichols. Okay. She and Nichols, and then this kind of spurred off into, into, um, some work by a this person Ames in 1992. And they started talking about this idea of what it means to be successful. 
okay? And so I, I, as I became familiar with Carol Dweck's mindset, I also knew the theoretical underpinnings of her theory, uh, of, of her concept of mindset. Um, and so I wanna share a little bit about that as you read these pieces here. Again, some of you are probably very familiar with um, Carol Dweck's work and it's amazing. I mean, honestly, it's, it's really good. Just more and more research coming out with adults as well as kids in the classroom or sport or physical activity. But the original theory that she was involved with was a theory called the achievement goal theory. Okay, and I want you to kind of take a peek at this. And then I'll, I'll talk about the importance of the environment to create this climate that's super impactful. So basically the idea is, and again, very close to growth and fixed mindset, it's how kids judge themselves to be successful in a performance setting, okay? And basically, it's a combination of two things, who they are, their orientation, okay? What they're born with, what they come in with, and the climate that you create. Those two things make up what's called the state of involvement, how they mentally think about success and failure, okay? in as an example, your practice, okay? So let's say Paul's my player. He's gonna come into my thing. Paul is ultra competitive, okay? Right, Paul? Paul was highly ego oriented, okay? He hates to lose, okay? So does Lee. So do Lee's kids. I don't know where they got it from, okay? As in like hates to lose, as in like, throwing monopoly pieces across the room as an example, okay? And you get so pissed off and all of a sudden you're just super highly ego oriented, okay? You judge yourself to be successful when you win or beat other people, okay? And when you fail, you make excuses, you quit, you have poor coping strategies. You know, Paul goes, he loses, I'm taking my ball, I'm going home. This sucks, you suck, referee sucks, everything sucks, okay? Or you're mastery oriented. You feel successful when you work hard, try hard, get better. Now, the thing about these two things, they're not mutually exclusive. You can be high in both. And you can imagine that the best performers in the world are high in both. I can tell you as a kid, I was not, okay? And I was crazy competitive, crazy. And some of you are like, that's me you know, and I get it. Okay. And I lacked coping strategies. I lacked process orientation. Okay. I was just super competitive and I had to learn over time because I had good teachers and I figured it out for myself, a combination of the two, how to involve this and in who I am. Now, the thing about this is it's okay to be performance oriented as long as you keep winning. Okay. And you can think about this with some of the kids you get at 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Who wins? Bigger, faster, stronger kids, okay? And if they have a climate that is also performance when they get in the car and the, and the kid gets in, he goes, I won every game. And the, and the dad goes, you did and you're big time. And he goes, I am big time, right? And all of a sudden, big timer Joe, you know, gets in the car and he goes, I'm big time. Now, this kid is big time because he's bigger, faster, stronger. Okay, maybe. Okay. If that big kid is also process oriented, then they're also going, I need to get better. I need to improve. I need to work hard. If they're strictly this and then they lose, they get in the car and the dad goes, You lost, you know, to little Billy Small Cheese, you know, and you're Billy Big Cheese. All of a sudden, it's like the dad goes, You suck. You know, second place is first loser. And you can imagine some of these kids, okay? What do you think these happens to these kids? They quit, they make excuses, they don't come back, right? So even if you're talented or untalented, the idea is can you be process oriented, which I'll talk about in a second. And can you as the coach, because this is what the research suggests, is that kids 
are malleable. Kids are changeable. Kids can get a growth mindset. Kids can learn to be process oriented. Kids can learn to have coping skills where they learn to improve, try hard, get better. I know that because I've done it with my kids. I've done it with kids that I've had. And I look at a kid and I go, super product oriented. Okay, and again, I've got three boys, okay? Super, they want to win, throwing Wii remotes across the room. I would always say to them when they lost, really proud of you for working hard if they worked hard, okay? If they were upset, why are you upset? When they won, they go, I'm big time. I want to say, I'm so proud of you for working hard. What do you think, what do you think got you to win? You know, and I focused on the process, process, process instead of the product, product, product. There is zero wrong with winning, zero, okay? But at the same time, if you think about high level sports, and I can tell you at the highest level, again, having been in the world championship before with athletes, is it's about the process, learning to win, the process of what it is going to take to get us a world championship, a medal, you know, these types of things. Same thing at the highest level in sports. And if you look at the top level, it's like, you know, Nick Saban has a document that's literally called the process. Pep Guardiola is talking about the process all the time. You know, all these people are talking about process, 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 even though we all know that they want to win. So the idea just in terms of the fundamental aspect of growth mindset and fixed mindset is creating a climate that's focused on improving, getting better, trying hard, working hard. Again, when kids fail, which they will, how do we help them move through that? Because just because a kid is throwing a temper tantrum at, after a game doesn't mean he or she's a lost soul. In fact, it's like you look at that kid and you go, oh, okay. Because for me, it's easier to tame a lion than push a sheep. Okay, so easy, right? And so that kid who, who doesn't have any ability to calm down and they're going crazy, you know, it's like, oh, how do I help that kid understand how to improve, try hard, get better? Because the truth is, if you can create this environment over this environment, this is what you get. So the discussion from Joan at the beginning was about pressure, okay? Pressure is always going to be there, but of course, it's how we have kids understand that, they, okay, this is a must-win game. They all know it's a must-win game. You think they're dumb? It's a final, okay? Plus, their parents have wound them up for the last 45 days about this is the final. You know, get to the final and be big time because you know what you get? A trophy. And the trophies are huge because, God, that's so important, you know? So what? But learning to win and what you get from winning, you know, the feeling and the idea and the focus on the process of that aspect, and if you get that win, is so massive. So massive, you know? I was saying to, and I'll talk about these in a second, but I was saying to Paul and Tom at the beginning, my twins, my oldest, you could drop him off on another planet with school. No problem. The twins, second borns, school, not so important for them, okay? And so we've talked a lot about how they can start to take ownership of it and how proud I am of them for trying and working hard. Literally, their, their, their grades came out, right? Their end point, their win or loss came out, and they happened to do well. You know, and as I said to them, I'm so proud of you for working hard. I'm so proud of you for trying. I'm glad you got the, the, the result you were looking for, right? And as my wife says all the time, you are our sons, not our grades, you know? But we talk about that a lot, you know, and that was a big thing with us. And so these ideas, these are some ideas that I talk about in the book and some more as well, how to create this mastery competitive climate, rewarding effort um, and trying hard over ability. You know, again, I know innate ability exists. I understand that. I'm not foolish. You know, and those kids might up, end up at the top of the heap, okay? Um, but who knows? You know, I don't know. It's not for me to say what a 15-year-old should or shouldn't be shooting for and what their ceiling is. Use failure as fuel. Help athletes view failure as an opportunity to grow. Try new things, right? That's a big deal for me. Are you willing to go up in front of the group and try something new? Relative age effect, with, which is RAE, which I talk about a lot in my book. Relative age effect, for those of you that don't know, is the idea that kids that are older, January birthdays, as an example, are selected to top teams more than um, October, November birthdays, okay, which I'm very familiar with the research because I have an October birthday. My son, one of my sons, and so I know that research. Um, and, but there is no long-term difference between kids that are in the professional leagues. And in fact, there's a lot of research to suggest that those kids 
who were late born birthdays have longer careers and make more money, which is some pretty cool research that I cite in the book. But with relative age effect kids, it's like, it's not, it's not the bigger kid's fault that he's bigger. <laughs> it's not his fault or her fault, her fault, right? So it's like, how do you help them work through that and focus on the process? How do you continue to work with the younger kid who continues to get smashed on the ball, you know? And, and how do you keep their spirits up? How do you keep their confidence up? What confidence is something I talk about in the book as well. And then I, we talk about managing comparisons because one of the things that is key in achievement goal theory is self-referenced improvement as opposed to other referenced, right? It's like, okay, you did really well. You got a 90% on the test, but your friend gets his test back and it's a 95% and you go, I'm an idiot. No, you're not, you got a 90%. But now you're an idiot because your friend got a 95%, okay? You improved really well on the skill, but you're, you know, you improved by two tenths of a second in a 40 yard dash or something like that. I'm just an arbitrary example. But the other kid who's bigger, faster, stronger improved because, you know, he got a, he got, he's 10, 10 tenths faster than you. Okay. He's a whole point faster than you. You still improve. So it's all about self reference as opposed to other reference. And then this idea of learning to win. Okay. I know, again, winning exists. And again, I'm not stupid. I understand I work in those environments. There's nothing wrong with winning. There's nothing wrong with striving to win. But for, for me, it's about the process of getting the result. What did you do to get there? Okay. And this is just one of the things that I talk about in the book. Um, I shared a little bit of this story about my Owen. Um, and you don't need to see those because you can't read them anyway. But Owen's one of my twins. And he, he indicated he wanted to improve on something. And knowing the research, I sat with him and I talked to him and, you know, saw, you know, told him how, how proud I was for him for trying and, and yeah, dad, but I'm not going to do this. Yeah. But son, if you continue to try this, you're going to have the opportunity to get better. And what mom and I expect is just that you put yourself out there. I'm really proud of you for putting yourself out there and kind of this whole thing that we've built up over time. Uh, and then I cited some examples from pop culture, you know, about this kid wasn't successful at 14 and this kid was successful, but he had to work at it or she had to work at it. Um, and so that was just my example of kind of, um, you know, using achievement goal theory and and self and and um, growth mindset. So my point in going through that is that's just one of the concepts that I talk about, you know, and just in terms of the idea of talent is I wanted to have a kind of a one stop shop. And this is what Tom and I were talking about a little while back, where I could say to give a parent a resource, give a coach a resource and go, look talent is changeable talent is a journey not a destination and yes i understand innate ability exists but we as coaches get who we get we as teachers get who we get you know we as parents get who we get how can we help them make the most of their talent as they move through this journey so yeah that was my that was my idea and thought and um and the thing i'm trying to send out into the world and yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. So give me some questions or even just a theory that we talked about that I went through pretty quickly, but anything that I talked about or anything you want to ask me about? Hold on, I got some people. There's a few great, good questions in that chat. Yeah, I got to one of them, Talent Code. <laughs> How would you respond to the scenario? Your top player becomes lazy has a bad attitude and responds negatively to any type of criticism. Yeah, so that happens, okay? Um, for me, that is probably a process because he or she didn't become lazy overnight, you know? Maybe as an example, and I'm gonna use the theory that I popped up there. Maybe as an example, that kid is very ego-oriented and is used to winning, you know, because you're saying they're the top player, okay? Top player in the, in the youth age group says to me that they have something unique big, fast, strong, good finisher. Okay. And so maybe they've been getting by on that. So for me, I frequently like to bring a, and I'll, I'll put this up, bring a player in and build their awareness. Okay. And ask them if they're aware of their behavior, depending on the age, they're going to have awareness. Sometimes they have no idea. But I really try and get them to understand what they're doing and ask them, are you aware of what's going on? You know, and almost also talk to them about, listen, one of the things that makes you great 
is your willingness to work hard for the team or something along those lines, something that they can control. Okay. Um, and then talk about, you know, look, but some of the things that are going on now, you know, or you're putting your shoulders down, you know, you're quitting after things. It's like, you have so much to offer. Offer. You are great when you're doing these three things, but I don't see you doing these three things now. Do you agree with that? You disagree? And the likelihood is if you have a good relationship with that kid, then maybe they're going to go, yeah, you know, I'm not doing that. It's like, okay, how can I help you kind of get better at those couple of things? And so for me, it's about building awareness, kind of educating them on who they are and aren't, helping them with a plan, you know, and helping them stay after it. So that's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chris. That was a, that was an old book. That was a fun one. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I got to a couple of the questions, but if, if I didn't ask me like pull your sound up or type it in the chat again, um, or Paul or, or Tom, unless Tom's gone to sleep, um, give me some questions. I'm still awake, so don't worry about that. But yeah, this is great. Great info. Um, I mean, where do we start, right? I mean, you have such knowledge. Um, but let's open it up to some of the other people who are uh, here with some questions, I hope. So I've got I've got a kind of a question slash comment observation. Yeah, but you know, you talk a little bit about timing, right? Like the timing of intervention and that kind of stuff. Cause you know, the more and more that like we're talking with like educators now in the school system, they're talking about, you know, how you can start to see kind of deficiencies in kids as early as five, six, seven years old, meaning yeah. like in reading and writing and in athletics and everything else. Right. Which, which, which takes us back to like Tom's whole philosophy, which as you guys know, uh, I'm fully bought in is that, that, you know, when parents can engage with their kids positively, right, and you get them going, but, okay, so that's really the early age and getting those synopsis and neurons going, right, right, Tom, like in you know, a language or whatever else, that gets them off to a flying start, but talent, and there, there's different stages, I think, like throughout like, you know, middle school and adolescence, and even as a professional or a young professional where they see great, great improvements in a player's ability, even late in their life. Like I know personally that I became way more technical when I was like 21, when I started to do soccer camps for kids. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was doing reps and reps and reps and trying to do all these moves because I was teaching the kids how to do it. And I, I can't, would come back from my season. I'm like, wow, I'm way more technical. So I think there's a lot of this stuff about timing too, because I think you can continue to develop. Like, and I'm talking specifically for soccer. Yeah. 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 There's, there's actually, that's a good point. Um, there's a couple of things there. Uh, the idea that um, like teens, like late teens, there's a great book um, by Sarah Jane Blakemore called The Secret Life, The Secret Life of a Teenage Brain. Really good book. And I cite her research in my book because it talks about how critical learning is and how much you can still change and learn at 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And, you know, you think about that relative to the kids that we get. You know, and, and I've talked to, it's funny because Greg Vanny, who's the head coach of the Galaxy, you know, has coached for a long time. He's coached kids, you know, and he's a good friend of mine, lives right down the street, um, and I've known Greg for a long time. And we used to always talk about the importance of teaching, even young pros, you know, everybody needs and, and can learn, and everybody has an ability to move their, you know, their current needle, you know, and taking that time to teach both others and yourself, you know, is just a huge component in terms of talent development. And again, Sarah Jane Blakemore talks about that a lot in terms of a teenage brain. But of course the idea is, you know, can we create those environments, you know, for the, for the kids and, and create that opportunity for them and have that open mind that they can change. You know, because sometimes kids get in our doghouse at 17, it's like, oh, this kid, 
You know what I mean? It's like, and, and for, for a kid to get out of a doghouse at 17, it's like, you go, well, they're never going to get that. That's not true. You know what I mean? It's like, maybe they won't get it the way you want them to have it, but they might be able to get it in a different way. And to have an open mind is really part of the journey that I want us to explore in terms of talent. Yeah, can I ask, ask a question? Good. Okay. Um, so first off, uh, fantastic. Uh, I love these uh, partners in development um, meetings. Uh, your, your knowledge, your experience, uh, your ability to communicate uh, as a teacher and a coach is phenomenal. And I, I love everything that you've said it's a lot to take in and kind of process, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, for myself as a coach. And I think, you know, I'd say all of us that are on here are looking at, okay, how do we improve our little sphere of the, the world or the galaxy, right? Yeah. And I think there's different components. There's the environment that we create with the players in the time that we have allotted, you know, in the field, um, at the games. Uh, but then there's also the environment that kids grow up in. And, sure. you know, how can, we, how can we do a better job of influencing that? So it's, it's then not just us as coaches uh, taking in the information, becoming better coaches, to the players, but then also facilitating uh, closer relationships with the parents where the parents are open to what we are learning and understanding. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I talk to parents and I say, look, I'm here to coach character. Uh, if they go on and become a great soccer player, great. Mm -hmm. But I failed if they don't go on to become a, a better human being. Yeah. That they've learned how to process information and be able to have the tools. Now you're, you know, you're a terrific coach and, and a parent. <laughs> Will you adopt me as your son? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Um, well, well, that yeah. I mean, so let me answer, let me answer your question about engaging parents, and I can turn yeah. over to Paul and Tom in, in my experiences. First of all, if you ask my kids if I'm a great parent, it would depend on the day. If I'm taking their video <laughs> game away, if I'm having a go with them, you know, because believe me, I'm a pain in the ass, uh, as you can imagine, um, as we all are as parents, by the way, if we really love our kids. Um, but in terms of parent engagement, for me, and I, and I love what you're saying, Nick, in terms of like engaging them and talking about character development. I also think that think the idea of a, collabor a collaborative effort, which has started when they're younger, in the club, you know, and, and this idea of we can do this together. And listen, I'm here to coach your son or daughter. I would like them to have a voice. It's about the process, which is why I start with that chapter up front in my book. Okay. And it's about us as, as, as a group together, you know, and when you have an issue with me, parent, come and talk to me, let's talk this out. Okay. And frequently, and this is where I, I also, I learned a long time ago, it was a guy named Tad Boback. I stole this from him. He used coach blues a long time ago. He might still, I don't even know. I haven't seen him in years. But he talked about how there's a different starting place of parents and coaches. The coach thinks club, coach, kid. And the kid thinks, or the coach, or the parent thinks kid, club, uh, kid, coach, club. Okay, or kid, team, club, right? Where we have a different starting place in how we talk to parents, right? And I think going in with an understanding that the, that the parent is frequently thinking, I'm starting with my son or daughter in this conversation first, because that's the truth, Okay. And just getting that understanding that we're talking to that particular parent and getting off the table right away that like, listen, I love your son or daughter. They're an awesome kid. And, and this is how I'm going to help them get better. And then start to talk about the challenges that you have in the team or the, or the club and everything else there. I think just having that starting place in mind, I just thought was such an interesting comment by this particular veteran coach. I just thought I would share that and Thank think you. about that. But, yeah, good. Yeah, I mean, it is a lot in here, <clears throat> which is why, again, I, I wrote the book because I wanted to try and get that out in a way that a parent could pick it up, consume something, 
you know, put it down, you know, it's definitely written <clears throat> in a very pragmatic way, you know, very, very pragmatic, very practical. Um, and again, I've got great editors. Uh, the editors I have are, it's a big education publisher and they knew how to create a document for teachers, coaches, or parents that they could pick it up, turn to page 70 and get an idea, you know, as an example. <clears throat> um, yeah. Any other questions? Paul, Tom? No, I mean, I've had the opportunity to go through the book and, and it, it really is, it's like Tom said, it, it's like 10 books in one. It's just an amazing book. I, and I do see it being like a really amazing read for parents. You know, besides educators and coaches, I think parents, I think are gonna get a lot out of it. Yeah, um, it's, um, Paul's got a digital version. I'm allowed to send everyone a few of those out. The print version won't, it's on Amazon. You can pre-order it. Um, and I think it's going to be out early April, mid-April. Um, apparently there's some supply chain problems in the world. I wasn't aware of this. Uh, I don't watch much news, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> they're sitting in a book. Uh, they're sitting in a, in a bin probably in the harbor next to Tom Beyer. <laughs> you know, what might be interesting is getting kind of a, getting a feel for some, some coaches out there on, on how they approach this, you know, in their club, you know, like, you know, I think if we really wanted to, to kind of learn, like, like Mick, what kind of stuff do you do with your parents and, and, um, or your team to kind of create that, that, that culture of development right now? Are you asking me that question? <laughs> yeah, or whoever wants to answer it, you know, I mean, okay. there's, there's a bunch of people on whoever wants to answer it. What are some of your, what are your, some of your methods for creating this kind of growth mindset and partnership with parents? Um, well, for, for me, so I'm, I'm with SG1. Um, it's a terrific club. I think, you know, Mike Carroll and Mike Carroll's a phenomenal uh, coach, coach educator. Uh, teacher, trainer, you know, just wealth of knowledge. Um, so I learn a lot from, from him. Um, as far as with parents, I try, like, usually it's a kind of a team talk at, at the beginning of the season. So I've, I've been with SG1 for two seasons now, and it's it's having that that team talk, but it's also having – individual talks so you know transparency for me is once again it's it goes down to um you know kind of it being a character and seeing a child or player as as a whole so my goal is to be able to communicate that with a parent that I care about your child and I care about your child's development. And I understand that, you know, how I coach will, will be good for some kids. It might not be good for other kids. And I saw like, and I'll, I won't use her, her name, but I, I coach a 2008 girls team and uh, there was a player and we were button heads. And so I just, I reached out to the parent and I said, let's see if we can go have coffee and, and have a chat. And we sat and, and talked and I just got to know the child better and some of the things that they'd been through. And so now I'm seeing this as, as a whole person, not just a player on the field. And so I had to adjust things in my character and how I interacted with her to be more affirming, more encouraging. And uh, it's been an incredible change. And I see her blossoming, flourishing, uh, both as a player, but also in our team talks, you know, that we have. Uh, she organized a thing for the girls to do something special for me for Christmas, which just blew me away. Um, so 
it, it's it's a learning process. And I think what Lee's saying is creating an environment that it's we're in partnership. I have your your child's best interests at heart. And that's their development. And sometimes, you know, I've I've had a situation where a player doesn't have the ability for the pressure of the team that they're on and they're they're being whether you want to say going to a lower team and that's a challenging conversation but helping the parent to understand right now this may be the best place for this player to be able to adjust and and develop to come up to a more pressurable environment and maybe six months from now they'll be able to move up but i think it's a it's an ongoing conversation and it's an ongoing dialogue that i try to connect with you know the, the the parents as a team group of parents but also as an individual and then with meetings like this it's like okay let's have more of this so that there is dialogue and i'm going to throw out a question to lee is okay, is there some way that we can get these books mass? Uh, you know, is there a price reduction that we can get? Because I can want to have it for myself, for all the parents in our club. But I also, uh, I work with KDISD. I mentor a child, in, um, you know, um, Men Who Mentor program. And I'm trying to get into KDISD because to me, this is a book that is not just for soccer players or for fans. It's, it's across the board. It's, it's helping parents to understand what a child is going through and how do they help them? How do they have those conversations? Yeah, so. I mean, it, it is definitely an education book. I mean, I'm going to be... I'll be doing a lot of those things in classrooms and that kind of stuff uh, over the over the next few years for sure. Um, and yeah, I know I can get group discounts um, once those things come out. I just I don't know exactly how that works. Um, okay. but yeah, no, I know it's I know it's doable. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. I, I thought I saw Ricardo's hand up as well. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to add that I agree 100% with what Mick was suggesting us for. We need to have a good relationship with the parents. I feel like because we work with kids, um, if the parents are not on board with your development plan for their individual kid, um, it's really tough for us as coaches to achieve our goals. Um, I've noticed that a kid can be extremely engaged, but engaged parents help you a ton more. Uh, engaged parents are going to be pushing the kid, motivating the kid, bringing the kid to as many training sessions and games as possible. And that just rushes development, right? And at the end of the day, that's what we want. So um, I, I agree 100% with what, what Mick was saying. So that's why I lowered my hand. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, more. Yeah. thanks for having me. Um, it was fun. Thank you, Lee. Awesome stuff, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, man. Yeah, so um, keep me posted. Let me know I can help and happy to answer anybody's questions if they want to shoot me an email. Go ahead. You know. I had one comment. Sorry, I can't turn my my, uh, my camera on at the moment. Ahead, but man. I just want to make a, make a comment. Thanks. Um, Good stuff, Lee. Thanks um, for Tom and, um, and Paul for having this. Very interesting. Um, I run a grassroots futsal um, club slash organization. So we deal with all different skill levels, um, different ages. And I also have a kid who's in the MLS Academy. So as a coach, you know, I see it all. And I think some of the key things that you said was that I always tell parents and I tell my wife and I tell anyone that I can think of is that environment is key. And I think that's the biggest thing. We have yeah. so much RAE, we have early selection. And a lot of times coaches, you know, even at the higher levels, you know, it's almost like I wish they would review or read this book because I think sometimes as coaches at those higher levels, they, they get caught up because it's the nature of 
you know, what they're doing, trying to pick professionals at an early age, which is a tough task for anyone. But I think, you know, our, our goal as coaches is to, to produce lifelong, you know, players and lovers of the game because everyone can't be a pro and these kids will grow up to be adults and be the future coaches and mentors and things like that. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, very key. So I'm glad that you touched on that. And um, yeah, you know, that, that was pretty much my, my main comment, but um, a lot of good takeaways. So thanks for, thanks for having me. Well, yeah, man, that's good. Good comment. Yeah. I'm lifelong lovers of the game. And that, that's always how I felt in my house, you know, with my sons who, you know, all have high aspirations to, to do stuff with the game. But for me, it's like, if you don't love the game, you're not going to pursue it. And you're certainly not going to enjoy it for all it's given me as a human being and all of us for sure. Um, you know, Tom, any, uh, any uh, final words? Let me unmute myself. Yeah, no, I mean, I just stress, I mean, the book is wonderful. Uh, not just because I, I wrote the foreword, but um, clearly, like I said, it's like 10 little books inside one. And uh, I mean, it's just got incredible anecdotes and uh, great uh, experience from Lee, not just from football or, or soccer, but from multiple sports as well. That's what you got to, you got to know that, that uh, Lee's not just a football guy, but he's, he's got experience amongst the array of different sports um and and i just can't stress how good the book is um so hurry up and go out and order it and uh i think you're going to really enjoy it yeah hurry up and order it so it doesn't come for three months <laughs> exactly awesome stuff cool well, appreciate it lee so much appreciate yeah. everyone jumping on um have a great week and and uh, keep igniting the kids. Never give up on the kids. Keep igniting them. Keep uh, keep engaging and partnering with the parents. Yeah, cool. All right, thanks, guys. See you guys. Thank you, coaches. All right, guys. Thanks much. See you guys.